Well, I think the issues that I've had really with AI and history or, or history in the AI conversation has been that it's focused primarily on the atomic bomb as an analogy. There's a certain level of techno-narcissism where every inventor of a technology wants to wants to convince you it's the single point of savior for humanity or the singular point of extermination of humanity. Doesn't it feel a little bit like this? all this catastrophism is a bit narcissistic? Yes, definitely. I think everyone wants to be Oppenheimer. Verity, where does this podcast find you? I'm in New York at the moment. You're in New yeah, York. I'm usually based in London, but I'm here for a talk. In your uh, debut book, AI Needs You, How We Can Change AI's Future and Save Our Own, uh, you write that when history enters the AI conversation, it most often distorts rather than informs. What do we get wrong about AI in terms of our perception of it? Well, I think the issues that I've had really with AI and history or, or history in the AI conversation has been that it's focused primarily on the atomic bomb as an example, as an analogy. I don't think it's a helpful analogy um, for lots of different reasons. I mean, obviously, the circumstances in which it's created are very unique. Um, it's a weapon, and it, but it's not really that I want to pick apart the like specific different ways that it's not like the atomic bomb. It's more that if we're trying to sort of create a future path for AI that's beneficial and in defense of the public good, something that is democratically controlled, then I think looking to a sort of wartime created weapon really like removes the agency that we have. And that's a problem I find in the AI conversation quite a lot generally is this sense that AI is a thing that's happening to us and we are sort of passive passengers in the back of the back of the car. Whereas whereas actually what history shows and what show in the book is that we are very important players in guiding how technology develops. My sense is, and I'm curious if you agree with this, my sense is that there's a certain level of techno narcissism where every inventor of a technology wants to wants to convince you it's the single point of savior for humanity or the singular point of extermination of humanity. That my shit is just so important. What I've invented here is so incredible that it's either going to save or destroy the world. And and the reality is it's probably somewhere in between, right? I just don't doesn't it feel a little bit like this all this catastrophism is a bit narcissistic? Yes, definitely. I think Everyone wants to be Oppenheimer, right? Yeah, and the, so the movie true. probably didn't help. It's like but. such an obvious observation. I never thought of that. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. It, it's, it makes you sort of one of the central characters in the history of our entire species. If you, you know, do something on that level that sort of changes for good what society is and, and how we operate. And you see that the examples that I choose in the book to look at the history of science, I look at everything after the atomic bomb because it was this singular moment that sort of changes science and changes how people see science. And unfortunately, some I think people I think have taken slightly the wrong message from that story and they want to actually create something. So I completely agree with you. It strikes, it, it, typically new technologies either create a new batch of um a new batch of powerful companies or that goes to the incumbents. This feels like so far it's going to the incumbents. Even OpenAI feels sort of a proxy for Microsoft. Do you see, there's, there's been a, just an explosion in market capitalization of value here that's inspired by AI. And so far, I guess you could argue NVIDIA is sort of a new player, but so far it feels like it's going to the incumbents. Do you think it's going to play out where there'll be more kind of long tail value creation or do you see that this will you know, this reflects a trend towards kind of the, the rich get richer, if you will. Yeah, well, the sort of one of the main arguments I make in the book is that science and tech is as shaped by the sort of politics and culture of the time as the politics and culture of the time is shaped by the science and tech, that actually technology is incredibly political and um sort of reflects in a way the sort of existing zeitgeist and you see this throughout history and I think it's no coincidence then that if you think about what type of society are we living in now you know vastly unequal extremely polarized uh, a huge lack of trust in our institutions and our leaders and I think that's therefore playing out and you're seeing it, you look at just 
San Francisco itself and the kind of contrast between the riches and the poverty there. And I think that sort of plays out in the industry. There's groups of us that have been doing work on AI and ethics and responsible AI and how are we going to manage AI as society for years. And then as soon as it kind of reaches the mainstream, it just splits immediately along US partisan lines. And either you think AI is woke, you know, or you think it is racist and there's sort of no where in between. So I don't think that it's a surprise that we're seeing those sort of existing entrenched divides replicated in AI. And I don't think we have a lot of hope for them just naturally resolving themselves. I think if we want them to resolve ourselves, if we decide that they want that we need them to, that that can and we can do that, but it sort of needs to be a choice that we take rather than something that will happen naturally, I think. But you, you, in your seat, you must see a decent amount of deal flow or what people are most excited about where capital and human capital and IQ is going. In terms of the the, the gold rush of uh, financial and human capital into an AI, which rivers or branches does it go into? Does it go into media? Does it go into healthcare? Is it being used to try and figure out, I don't know, weapons deployment? Or where do you see... I mean, a lot of these things are self-fulfilling prophecies, right? If everybody focuses on AI to, to you know, make commercial real estate more productive and office layouts more more easy easy to build, then AI will be great at it. Where, where are people pointing the AI cannon right now? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I don't, I mean, I'm curious what you think, Scott, but the, the actual deployment in real terms in a way that is, you know, affecting the profits, affecting the bottom line of com- non-tech companies, so, you know, companies benefiting from AI products already doesn't seem to be happening. And I'm starting, I kind of felt this when when chat GPT blew everything up, you know, just over a year ago. It, we went into this new like massive hype cycle and you couldn't move for people saying that AI was going to change absolutely everything. And my instinct seeing how hard it really is to actually integrate AI into stuff, I mean, not least because some of these big businesses and certainly governments, you know, not even really well equipped for digital, just basic digitization and digital transformation, let alone kind of layering AI into that. And I think that has borne out, you know, 18 months or however long later that you're not really seeing it going into integrating quickly into existing business models. So what I've seen is huge use of chatbots for customer service, but not in a way that is like really evident that it's working. We had, you probably saw the issues with DPD, the parcel delivery service a few weeks ago where they've replaced some, you know, they they use some new LLM and it immediately starts saying horrific things about the company and swearing and all sorts of stuff. So, you know, we're sort of seeing people pull back from that. But there is promise, I think, if they can operationalize things like, you know, the use of AI in medical imagery, for example. But where I see it going at the moment is a lot of people slightly flailing, feeling like we should be able to use this for productivity. We should be able to use it for for efficiencies. We should be able to use it somewhere in our business and we must immediately integrate it everywhere, but they're not quite sure where to go or what to do next. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of pushback in the media, um, in the media industry, I should say, rather than the media writing about it. Uh, We've seen this Hollywood strikes, of course, and I think that shows where some of the kind of easy gains might be made, but not necessarily the best for the long term. And you... You write that the national security establishment and tech leaders think we're in an AI arms race and this, that that is a problematic narrative. Say more. Yeah, I think it all feeds into the same thing we're talking about. If you sort of agree and accept that AI is the revolution of our time and it's happening rapidly, then it's quite easy to be convinced that AI is a battle to be won. That's not how I think we should see AI. AI is an exciting new science and technology that we should see as a potential to sort of uplift humanity, not something that becomes this sort of very nationalistic, militaristic focus. And instead, that's exactly what's happened. I mean, if AI is in the conversation of geopolitics at all, it's as an arms race, usually between the US and China, and one of them has to win. And 
I think that's, you know, I think that's bad for business because we're seeing these sort of semiconductor export bans that people are having to navigate around that I'm not sure how effective they're going to be anyway. Um, I think it's bad for dialogue and diplomacy and cooperation, collaboration, conversation, which we know is critically important to sort of safe management of the globe. And I think it's bad for sort of us as consumers, because if we continue to sort of whip into a frenzy about an AI arms race, then you're going to see AI directed into more militaristic routes, um, or you're going to see sort of the lack of free flow of ideas just make less progress and, you know, leave us with less good sort of products and services. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, I've set up this thing called the AI and geopolitics project at Cambridge, which is about trying to find alternative narratives when we talk about AI and geopolitics that are rooted more in collaboration rather than cooperation sort of competition just to say that's not to be naive national security is really important they used to work in national security you know economic competitiveness as a nation you know your our growth as a country or you know as as different countries thinking about their economic growth is critically important but what i show in the book by using this example and this analogy with the space race is that there's sort of no need to do that in a way uh, or, or there's a way to do that while also encouraging sort of inspiring, exciting science and cooperation and collaboration between nations, which I think is really just the only way forward. It's really interesting. It, it, I love your view on this and the space race. First off, I mean, it's weird. We don't have a food race. We don't have a media race. Well, I'll put forward a thesis, you tell me. It feels very bro and testosterone-filled to me. The tech is largely the domain of, of the people influencing it, running it, and making decisions are mostly men. And they immediately position it as this is a race and they become very nationalist. Like we can't sell chips to China. This is this technology is so powerful. We have a national interest in beating everybody as, as opposed to saying, okay, this is a marvelous innovation and it's gonna, it's gonna help the world it immediately turns very like there's just win lose and we like to your point we go militaristic and i wonder if it's a function of tech is still mostly invested by run by and controlled by uh men who tend to be young and tend to be just quite frankly more into the macho yeah i mean it's you know <laughs> it's this thread on everything we've spoken about isn't there there's like crazy hype cycle around revolutionary ai you know AI scientists as new modern day Opp Oppenheimers and arms race. It does all seem to be linked by this, um, these defining characteristics. And look, you know, boldness and bluster and sort of competition can all be really good things, but, uh, you know, they can also be not so much bad, but counterproductive. And I think that they are currently counterproductive. I think we're going to see less progress if we keep going down this route, frankly. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot in what you said. And the example that I um, talk about in the book, The Space Race, is a really interesting example of that, right? Because you get Kennedy, President Kennedy, being very macho and bold and, and blustery, but kind of in the best w way, when he sort of sets this moon mission, it's deeply political, a deeply political decision. There's no need to go to the moon. It's actually deeply unpopular at the time. People don't want to do it. It's extremely expensive. And he chooses it because it's this competition with the Soviet Union. We're in the midst of the Cold War. And it becomes this very antagonistic thing. So, you know, of course, you see the great speeches where he says, you know, we do this not because it's easy, because it's hard and it's so inspirational, but it's not true. You know, he's, he's doing it because they're at, at war and he's trying to win that war. But then he becomes sort of older, wiser, you know, go through quite a lot as an American president in the Cold War in just the, the sort of those three short years, chastened by the Cuban Missile Crisis where the world is on the brink of war. And he completely changes and he goes to the UN and he essentially offers a joint moon mission to the Soviets. You know, he says, Space has to be this place of cooperation and there's no sovereignty there, so there should be no issues 
you know, there's no issue of national sovereignty up in space. So there should be a, a way for us to cooperate. And it's that leadership directly inclu- and, and lots of diplomacy and hard work behind the scenes at the UN that leads to this UN Outer Space Treaty, which two years before anyone steps foot on the moon, determines that space is the province of all mankind, that space is a place for innovation and sort of benefiting all humanity equally. And it may have started in very sort of cynical nationalistic arms race terms, the space race, but, you know, we don't have nuclear weapons orbiting above us or nuclear weapons on the moon. No one owns the moon. We have things like the International Space Station and great, great cooperation in space science, sort of because of those political decisions. So... Yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> there's definite parallels with, with AI today and the sort of people in charge and the people leading it and, and what they value. We'll be right back. I'm curious. So there's, if you think about the interaction for you between government and private industry and then kind of value creation or wealth creation, I've always said that there is, you can't have a company worth more than $100 billion unless it's a bike ride from a world-class engineering university or a font of deep intellectual property, that it all starts with universities. And you can't go very far in AI without hearing about somebody who's involved with or teaching at Cambridge. Cambridge does feel like it's one of the epicenters of AI. And that's the good news. The bad news is after living in London for two years, I'm fairly confident they're not going to make any money. There's something about UK culture where it produces the IP and the IQ, but it doesn't find the Benjamins or the pounds or whatever the the slang is for currency. That the IP might come out of Cambridge, but someone in the US is going to monetize it. And I can't figure out why. Well, one, do you agree with this? But the UK seems to be especially poor in monetizing the intellectual property an incredibly deep education and IQ that they possess. Yeah, no, I mean, I do, I do agree. I think you know, people in the UK know it, and there are different diagnoses of why it happens and different like suggested remedies. I was really struck by it when I was researching the early internet for the sort of final um, case study with the book, which is looking at the early internet and how that developed. And uh, packet switching technology was was sort of invented concurrently by Donald Davies in the UK as it as it was um in the US. And there was sort of all the potential there given the kind of incredibly rich computing history, Turing being the the main example and the work that he was doing in the in the 50s. There was sort of all the potential intellectually there that the sort of the, the UK would invent the internet. But of course it's ARPA and it's and it's the US and and as a result, again, as a result, some very conscious political decisions, the sort of TCP IP protocol and the way that we have the the open internet today is is sort of built on the uh, uh, on the US model. But we, we you know we do struggle with that. And so, some of the issues is just <laughs> the sort of money and the investment is just not on the same scale. And these things take an extraordinary amount um, to to do that. But, you know, realistically, are we going to be able to compete with the US, China, India? And given the vast resources it takes, probably not. So then I think we have to look at what our unique role can be as the UK. And you advise people at the highest level around policy. How do, what do you think the government's approach should be to AI? Do you think it needs? we need to get out ahead of it? How do you feel about the Biden administration's AI, whatever they call it, AI task force, AI mandate? You know, supposedly there's some rules out there. I'm not entirely sure what they are. But what are your thoughts around, what What are you advising got different governments around policy and AI? So what I'm saying to people is that, look, AI is new, but invention is not new. You know, progress is not new. Let's look at how we've done this well before and try and learn from that. That is essentially what the book is about. Um, so I think there's a few different ways to do that. One is try and depoliticize it as much as possible. If it gets brought into the, and by that I mean sort of party politics, obviously it is deeply political as a subject, but if it gets drawn more and more into party politics, then we're not going to get to a good outcome. Um, I think diverse participation, sort of diverse viewpoints is absolutely critical to like public trust and um, also to getting to a good um, outcome. So the second example I use in the book is 
the regulation of IVF. She has lots IVF and human embryology research, early biotech, has a lot of, of similarities with AI today in terms of people freaking out about what it means to be human and these kind of deep ph philosophical questions. But the UK very successfully regulates it and has the sort of gold standard for regulation in this area globally because they set up a very diverse com commission of, yes, biologists, but also legal scholars, religious scholars, social workers, philosophers, to sort of look at these deep issues. Um, and then I also think, um, in addition to sort of participation and, and trust and people seeing that the government is acting, um, I think we have to think about, you know, where limits do need to be set. You know, I think if we want to encourage trust in AI and if we want AI to really succeed in, in bringing us sort of riches and plenty and prosperity in the future, then I think people do need to see that governments are willing and able to act against the kind of worst excesses and the worst harms, um, rather than because of often this arms race narrative, feeling like they can't touch it, they can't regulate anything, lest they sort of fall behind in the global race. So let's talk about something really important, and that is London versus New York as a a larger metaphor for comparing the UK versus the United States. Do you have any observations? I, I still, I've been living in London now for almost two years, and I spent a lot of time in the US, grew up here, and I'm still having trouble wrapping. I have some observations, you know, some of the, the easy ones around the weather and all that kind of fun stuff, and Premier League football is hands down the best sporting event in the world. So I, I have the easy stuff. Do you have any observations around the business environments or the cultures, contrasts, how what strikes you as the different zeitgeist between um, the two cultures? Oh, yeah. I mean, you're going to have to shut me up on this because like, this is one of my favorite subjects. Having spent my career working between the two, uh, the ways in which they're so different are so interesting to me. Why, why did you move out of interest to, to, to the UK? Uh, okay. It, it, the, the, the obvious questions are the ones you can't answer. Um, okay. it made, it made no sense. Um, around, um, my partner, mother, my children, I get to pick movies and investments. She gets to decide everything else. So uh, let's be clear. I'm an influencer, not a decision maker. And we have this practice. And this is probably more than you want. We have this practice where every couple of years we sit down and say, everything's on the table. What could we do or what could I do for you that would be a step change, increase in your joy and your happiness? Like, ignore all boundaries. What could we do? And seven years ago, she said, in five years, I want to move to Europe. And she said it very, I'm convinced this was strategic because she knows if she puts a five-year handle on it, I'll agree to anything because I have no sense of space and time. And if someone says, we'll do this in five years, it's like saying we're not going to do it. So I agreed, and then two and a half years ago, she she went to London and bought a house and enrolled our kids in school, and now I'm on planes all the time coming to the U.S. and going to Premier League games. But the, the, the less snarky answer is we move there because we can. And we didn't. people always say, oh, you move there because you don't like America, or you move there because of America. I'm like, yeah, I did move there because of America, but I moved there because I recognize such incredible opportunity and prosperity in America that I get to take my family abroad for a couple of years. So why did we move there? We moved there because we can, and we wanted to take advantage of a world-class city and the proximity of the continent. But there was no, like, what I'd call overriding strategic imperative here. I still don't have a good answer for why we moved to London other than we could and we thought it would be good for the kids. Anyways, that's my TED talk. It's I, it's interesting because quite a lot of Americans have moved recently. I think it's been more, you know, it's the highest on record number of, of Americans moving to the UK so specifically. And um, I studied in the US. I love the US. I think it stands for so many incredible things. I love visiting, um, sort of grew up wanting to, probably move there at some point but actually the older I've got I'm such a huge fan of London and of the UK um, and of Europe and I I find the the US culture is not something I could like live in full full time why is that pause there why what is it about US culture that doesn't doesn't appeal to you there's a few things so one I think the centrality of business and money is too much I think it's important in London, but it's not the most important thing 
to everyone um, all the time. If you go to Silicon Valley, it's all that's talked about all the time. It often is quite direct, as you'll know, but sometimes it's even just like these indirect proxies for just, oh, we're still just talking about money here, really. I find that very, you know, just distasteful, honestly. It just it just doesn't interest me um, that much. So um, in California specifically, I think the kind of vast inequality is just too difficult to, to sort of um, cope with. And it's been getting worse. So this is sort of, you know, the, the introduction of my book, um, I started it that way really as an excuse to start with a picture of George Harrison, because I'm a big Beatles fan, but um, I was also making a serious point. His dissolution with San Francisco, my dissolution with San Francisco, um, is just getting worse almost over years. So yeah, I find that obsession with money and, and business like very, very difficult. And I think, you know, American politics and um the the divisiveness is very difficult. I think we're really lucky in the UK. We have the BBC and a very well regulated media environment. Um, I, I, I'm sure I could get a lot of pushback on the idea that it's very well regulated, but compared to the US, um, it is very well regulated. I think, and I think we have to guard that uh, with everything that we have in in the UK. But it means in the UK, there's still a sort of shared sense of truth, which is important for a sort of functioning society, I think. And I think in the US, there's um, it, it, it's less and less clear to me that there is sort of an accepted sh shared sense of truth or, or, or sort of community um, in that way. So I, I could go on, but I don't want to keep being mean to a country that I do love and, and think is really important, but I could never, ever live here. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's... um. Uh, so obviously you've never been to In N Out Burger, or you would consider moving to California. <laughs> Scott, we have Shake Shack in London now, so uh, the only reason left to move to the U.S. is uh, is gone. Trust me, and In N Out is not as good as Shake Shack. Me I'm and sorry. my boys know about Shake Shack in the U.K., a U.S. company, by the way, and does not hold a candle to In N Out Burger. I will, I will accept that we are culturally. Uh, somewhat inferior and obsessed with money, but no, In and Out Burger is 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 <laughs> is the key. Not inferior, Scott. It's just not my taste. It's, you, you tricked me there to getting onto my favorite subject, which is trying to feel you know a sense of superiority about the UK. <laughs> yeah, very patriotic. Yeah, it's it's um, it's really. I'm glad we hooked you in with the football, though. That's oh, it's that's incredible. Good to know. It's absolutely incredible. That's what I'll. I think that's what I'll remember most. Um, about the UK is just experiences at Premier League games with um, my boys. Um, so just as we wrap up here, if you're trying to coach a young person around how, given the emergence of these new technologies and AI, such that they're AI literate, such that they're AI competent, such that they can use this as a weapon as they go into the work world, where do you tell them to start? Is it taking classes? Is it just using these platforms? Is what coach coach your twenty two year old self on how to ensure that they don't get left behind and they're not obsolete at thirty or thirty five? Well, I try not to freak people out by putting that on the table as an option, and um, I find that kind of easy because I don't believe that if you're not an AI, AI expert, that you're going to be obsolete. I think. That's for a few reasons, but the primary one is because I think that other disciplines are just as critical to the sort of development and integration of AI as the AI subjects themselves. I mean, what I, I absolutely love science and tech, and it's why I spent a lot, most of my life working in it. But I think a, a cultural problem that we have given ourselves by putting tech on a pedestal is we've undervalued humanities degrees we've undervalued other skills that people have if you don't you know if you're not an engineer or a physicist mathematician software engineer you know then 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 you're sort of not worthy in this new economy and i just i just don't think that's true but my main advice is like pick the thing you're passionate about i think trying to force yourself if you're not a technology uh, expert to become one it's not really going to be the thing that benefits you and gives you sort of a flour flourishing, fulfilling career. That, I mean, that's not what I did, right? I chose the things that I was passionate about, history and then politics. And through politics, I actually discovered by working on tech issues, national security issues inside government, I found my way to into technology. So I mean, th that is truthfully advice. However, I do think 
I think it's a great advantage if you can understand how the tech works. That doesn't mean you have to like take a full course or you have to make it part of your degree. I think, you know, reading about it is important. It's partly why I wrote the book. And I think having more people with dif different kind of perspectives and inputs and viewpoints is, is going to be actually the thing that gets us there in, in the long term. Verity Harding is a globally recognized expert in AI technology and public policy. She currently serves as the director of the AI and Geopolitics Project at Cambridge University's Bennett Institute for Public Policy and is the founder of Formation Advisory, a technology consultancy firm. Verity's debut book, AI Needs You, How We Can Change AI's Future and Save Our Own, is out now. She joins us from the cultural wasteland known as New York City. So, uh, Verity, the way I would describe the difference, my distillation of the U.S. and uh, the U.K. is that the U.S. is the best place to make money and Europe is the best place to spend it. What do you think? I think that's pretty fair. Pretty fair? Pretty fair? Yeah, it's a fair, fair summary. Yeah, I probably should have done that. Probably should have done that. It's not too late. Something tells me you're in a pretty <laughs> hot area. I, I'm, You are literally the most employable person I've ever met. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for your time, Verity. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it.